All right, so let's review really quickly, or remember really quickly, a uh, complex number is a number that we can write as a plus bi, where a and b are real. And i, what is special about i? Imaginary, what, what is i? Square root of negative 1. So i squared is negative 1. Um, and it's unfortunate that, that they named it named i the imaginary number because it's not really imaginary. It's just different than real numbers. Uh, they could have called them bread numbers for, and, and accomplished the same thing. So they just picked a name. Um, so imaginary doesn't mean they don't exist. That's just that's just the name that they gave. Um, and it's interesting. It actually turns out that I first came up uh, in solving cubic equations. So you s and it comes up in solving cubic equations that only have real solutions. So I came up came up with solving a problem, and it's kind of an intermediate step to come up with uh, solutions that are real numbers. That's where it first first came up. Um, all right, and we can, if we plot this number, we can think of plotting this number in what we call the complex plane. So if this we call in the complex plane, we call the y-axis the imaginary axis, and the x-axis the real axis. So the point A, A plus bi, we could plot that as the point AB in the complex plane. And what that tells us is, if I connect this up, like so, it's telling us that I'm moving A units in the real direction and B units in the imaginary direction. So just like we think of plotting a point and also just how we describe the vector. Think of an X direction and a Y direction, we can think of the same thing with a complex number. We call the absolute value, so I'm going to say z, we usually use z for complex numbers, z equals a plus bi, the absolute value of z. And that's the same as writing the absolute value of a plus bi. Just like we think of the magnitude of a vector, the square root of a squared plus b squared just like we did with vectors. So the magnitude is the length of this segment from the origin to a plus bi. The length of that hypotenuse. So we don't just change, we don't just make everything positive. The absolute value of a complex number is talking about the length of that segment. How far away is this from zero, zero? That's what this is asking us, what this is telling us. Yes? No, z, z is the point. The absolute value of z is the length of this segment. It's how far away it is from 0, 0. Z is the point here, a plus bi. The length, how far is, how far is this point from 0, 0 in the complex plane? Yes? Any variable, we just usually, for complex numbers, we usually use z. It's kind of tradition. Like for algebra, we use x. Kind of the same thing. But it can be any variable. All right, so for a quick example. If z is the complex number um, 4 minus 3i, the absolute value of z is the absolute value of 4 minus 3i. And that's going to be the square root of 4 squared plus negative 3 squared, which is it's our favorite triangle here, 5. 16 plus 9 is 25. Take the square root, and we get 5. So, and if we plotted this point, 4 minus 3i, 
we would be we go over four units in the x direction and negative three units in the imaginary direction. So that would be four minus three i. And this length would be five. The distance from the origin would be five units. So that's what the absolute value is telling us. Um, it just what we're going to get into. We're going to get into why we're talking about the complex numbers this way in just a second. I just wanted to to kind of get us to remember what a complex number was. All right. So what we want to do now is just like we did with vectors, we want to introduce an angle here. So we want to talk about this angle. So trig form. So we're going to do it, going to do just like what just what we did with vectors. So we plot our point in the complex plane. That's our point A plus B I. Or we can think of it as the point A B. I'm going to connect that point with the origin. And I'm going to drop, project this down so we have a triangle. And we're going to talk about this angle from the positive real axis. So the length of this side of this right triangle is A, and the length of this side is B. And I'm going to call this length instead of the absolute value C, Z. I'm going to say absolute value of z equals r for a radius. So the length of that is r. And just like we did for vectors, we can use what we know about trigonometry to write a and b in terms of theta. So if this length is r, the length of the hypotenuse is r, how do we write A in terms of theta? This is the adjacent side. So it's going to be R cosine theta. That's this side. And B is going to be R sine theta. This is the opposite side. So we could write Z equals a plus bi as r cosine theta plus i times r sine theta. And the way we usually write this is we factor out that r. Plus i sine theta. This is the trig form of this complex number. And theta here, tangent theta, just like we did with vectors, is b over a. Opposite over adjacent. So this is the trig form of a complex number. We have our distance, our absolute value, which is the length of this hypotenuse, how far it is away from 0, 0. And we have our angle that we're rotating from the positive real axis. We call R the modulus of Z. So the modulus and the absolute value mean the same thing. And theta is the argument. of z. So our trig form is the modulus, and then we have the cosine of the argument plus i times the sine of the argument. So what we're doing here is we're starting out with, with this idea of this trig form of a complex number, and then what we're going to do is, is what the reason we do it is it makes makes certain things much easier to work with. This shows up 
trig form, complex numbers show up in this form in electrical circuits, fluid dynamics. Um, you'll see complex numbers in quantum mechanics as well. Um, and we talked about the modulus and the argument has to do the, the, the this angle could have to do with the, the phase of the, the electric circuit, various various applications like that. So it's not just something that's, that we make up just for fun, but it is fun. Um, but it does, does have applications. All right, questions on what we're doing here. So all of this stuff is exactly, we can think about it exactly like we thought about vectors. We have an X component and a Y component. We have a real component and imaginary component. We have this angle. Angle is B, tangent of the angle is B over A. The length of the side of the triangle is R cosine theta. R sine theta for the length of this side of the triangle. So this is just like writing our vector in terms of sine theta and cosine theta. So nothing really new, we're just talking about a complex number instead of a vector. All right, let's look at a couple of examples of this. Um, let's write um, z equals negative 2 plus 2i in trig form. So we need our modulus, we need our, our absolute value, and we need our um, our argument, our theta. So R is the absolute value of Z. And for this vector, or sorry, this complex number, it's going to be negative 2 squared plus 2 squared. Just each piece squared, which is the square root of 8. And I'm going to simplify that to 2 square root 2. And we know tangent theta is 2 over negative 2, this piece over this piece, equals negative 1. So theta, tangent theta is negative 1. What quadrant are we in here? Negative 2 plus 2i. Negative 2 units in the x direction, positive 2 units in the y direction. Second quadrant. So we need a second quadrant whose tangent is negative 1. So we go to the unit circle and say, what's the second quadrant angle with tangent negative 1? Sine and cosine are equal. There's, there's sines plus or minus or opposite. What is it? What, I'm sorry, one more time. 2 pi. 2 pi is on the is, a, is 1 0. That's on the positive x axis. So what is what what angle has a tangent in the second quadrant has a tangent negative 1? What is it? 3 pi fourths. So theta is 3 pi over 4. So z is 2 square root 2 times cosine 3 pi over 4 plus i sine 3 pi over 4. And that's the trig form of this complex number. Yeah. Well, if I solved it, if I figured all this out, I would get back to where I started. So we wanted, we would just want to stop here. So if I if I did all this out, I'd end up back here. And that's our answer. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's that's our y component, our imaginary component. So the that that's always our imaginary piece. All right, let's go the other way. We let's write so this. This is kind of kind of follows along from what you asked, Nikki. If we wanted to write uh, for cosine five pi over six plus i sine five pi over six, in a plus b i form. So all this, what it, this is asking us to do is calculate all this out and simplify. So this is going to be 4 times cosine of 5 pi over 6. So we're over here. Here's 6 pi over 6. So we're up pi over 6 from there. Negative square root of 3 over 2. And sine of 5 pi over 6. 1 half plus 1 half i. 
and I'm going to distribute now. So this gives me negative 2 square root 3 plus 2i. If we did that process to this, this question, this number that we had before, we would get back to where we started. All right, questions, questions on what we did there? So where writing complex numbers in trick form helps us is first off in multiplication and division. So if you remember, remember multiplying and dividing complex numbers, to multiply we need to we write the parentheses, we FOIL everything, we, i squared is negative 1, we simplify. Um, and to divide complex numbers, we multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator, and then multiplied everything out and simplified. So it's a fair amount of work. Multipl multiplication and division, when we have our, our complex numbers in trig form is really easy. And what that will allow us to do is find powers, z to the fifth, z to the one hundredth, and roots, the fourth root of a complex number, very easily. Where before we didn't have any method really of finding the fourth root of a complex number. We're, that's what we're, that's what's leading, we're leading to be being able to do. <coughs> Alright, so let's look at two, two complex numbers in trig form. And z2 is r2 times cosine <coughs> theta 2 plus i sine theta 2. And we're going to multiply these together and see what happens. z1 times z2. So I get r1 times r2. Let me, I'll write it out here. All right, so I can multiply these two together. So I get R1 times R2. And then I have these parentheses. So let's multiply out these parentheses. So I get cosine theta 1 times cosine theta 2. Plus, now I'm going to multiply this times this. I times cosine theta 1. Sine theta 2. That's this times this. I'm going to multiply these two plus i times sine theta 1 cosine theta 2 and then finally these this last one i squared which is what is i squared? negative 1 so minus sine theta 1 sine theta 2 Now I'm going to group all the parts that have an I with them and all the parts that don't have an I with them together. And hopefully we see something that maybe looks a little bit familiar. <coughs> and then I get this, doesn't have an I with it, minus sine theta 1, sine theta 2. Does that look familiar at all? Cosine of an angle times a cosine of another angle minus the sine of an angle times the sine of another angle. So keep keep that in keep that in your in your head here. And we're going to do i times a sine. Multiply these i times the parts that have the i with them. And I'm going to rearrange this one. Uh, I'm going to write this one first. Sine theta one. Cosine theta two. Plus cosine theta one. sine theta 2. All right, and it sounded like a few people maybe recognized what this was. 
cosine of one angle times the cosine of another angle minus the sine of the angle times the sine of the other angle. That's the cosine sum formula. Cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2. This is the, the form of cosine alpha plus beta. Here alpha is theta 1 and beta is theta 2. Plus i times sine theta 1, cosine theta 2, cosine theta 1, sine theta 2. That's the sine sum formula. So in order to multiply two complex numbers in trig form, we multiply the moduli R1 times R2 and we add add the arguments so we don't have to do all the, the distributing and, the, and all of that other stuff these trig identities take care of that for us so we just multiply these two numbers together and add the angles together and we're done yes No, so this, I just wanted to show you that this came from something that we already know. We already know the cosine sum formula and the sine, sine sum formula. That's where this comes from. And if we divide Z1 divided by Z2, we're not going to go through the whole thing for division, but what would you guess happens with division? We're going to, here we multiply, so what are you going to guess we're going to do when we divide? Divide R1 divided by R2, and here we add it. What are you guys <coughs> going to do when we divide? Subtract. So to divide two complex numbers in trig form, we divide the moduli. and subtract the arguments. This simplifies multiplication and division of complex numbers amazingly. And when we start talking about powers of complex numbers, where we have z to the seventh power, we'd have to multiply, if we had a plus bi, we'd have to multiply those parentheses together seven times. This is going to simplify that process a whole lot. And this will also give us a way of finding the, the tenth root of a complex number. So we don't have a way of doing that. So these are our two big, two big uh, formulas here. So this was Z1 times Z2. So let's look at a couple of examples of using using this idea. So these uh, these formulas came from trig identities that we already that we already know. Okay. Let's say that z1 equals uh, eight times cosine of 120 degrees plus i sine of 120 degrees and Z2 is 6 uh, cosine 150 plus I sine 150. And we want to calculate Z1 times Z2. So we just figured out that we multiply <coughs> the moduli. So 6 times 8 is 48. We add the angles. 120 plus 150 is 270. And now we can simplify this. Cosine of 270 on the negative y-axis. Zero. 
and sine of 270? Negative 1. So these two complex numbers multiplied together gives us negative 48i. So it makes that multiplication really easy. How about z1 divided by z2? We're going to divide the moduli. So we get 8 sixths. Cosine of 120 minus 150. Negative 30. Plus i times the sine of negative 30. And I'm going to reduce this. 8 sixths reduced is 4 thirds. Cosine of negative 30. Unit circle? What is it? Square root of 3 over 2. And the sine of negative 30? Negative 1 half i. And I multiply through and I get 2 square root 3 over 3 minus 2 thirds i. All right, questions there? So what we're going to do on block day is, is extend this to finding powers of complex numbers. So z to the fourth, z to the fifth, whatever. Makes that really easy. And finding roots of complex numbers. The fourth root, the fifth root, the third root of various complex numbers. And when we have our complex numbers in trig form, it'll let us do that very easily. Yes? Why is the ion going to tell um, because it's the, the, if I go back here, um, we're thinking of the y component uh, as the imaginary component. So that's like our y component. Right. So the, it's, it's only the part that goes up or down. Okay. All right. And so our big, our big idea here to convert, we're thinking of this a plus bi sort of like a vector. The real part, the x part is a, the y part is b, and we could find our angle by the tangent of the angle being b over a. All right, questions? <coughs> okay. Well, uh, EOE, every other even. All right, there we go. 